This video literally couldn't have happened without Discovery Travel. More on them at the end of the video. Pokemon Masters, Bucky Potobi here, and I've done it. I finally caught 150 different species of Pokemon. I've got all eight gym badges of the Kanto region, and now I'm going for number 151, the mythical Pokemon known as Mew. I've only heard about it in textbooks that I found in the Cinnabar Mansion, but I've come here to find it. Up there, that is Mount Silver, or as it's known here, Mount Fuji. Fuji's the very man who created Mewtwo. Anyway, I'm ready to go up there, but I'm a little bit anxious because who knows what or who I'm going to find up there. We all know who's waiting at the top of Mount Silver. It couldn't be anyone else. The perfect final boss of any video game, Red, awaits us, the player character from Generation 1. His team comprised of the starters of the Kanto region, a Snorlax, which he caught on Route 12 or 16, an Eevee that has now evolved through High Friendship and Day to Espeon that he would have got in Celadon City, or perhaps the Lapras that he got from Silco, and then of course his mascot, his chief Pokemon Pikachu, one of the single highest level Pokemon to ever be in battle against. It's unevolved, suggesting that this is the Pikachu from Pokemon Yellow version. This version of Red tells the story of the Generation 1 player, and given that most people who were playing Pokemon Gold, Silver and Crystal for the first time were playing it as Generation 1's sequel, not part of some big mega franchise that was going to continue year after year, this was a real incredible treat for the player to finally get up to the top of the mountain and face off against themselves. But in order to get to this point, the player character had to travel all the way from New Bark Town through the Johto and Kanto regions, deal with the evil Team Rocket who was rising again, take on 16 Pokemon gyms, and finally get permission from Professor Oak to cut through where the Pokemon League stands, and after thwarting off Ursaring, Mistrevus, and even the pre-evolution to the pseudo-legendary Tyranitar, will make their way up to the summit, where they'll find Red. But the real question is, why exactly was Red there? We don't learn an awful lot about him from his mother character in Pallet Town in the post-game, just we know that he is a powerful trainer from a few years prior who took on Team Rocket initially. Red has come down from Mount Silver. Back in the old days, there was a Pokemon theory suggesting that he was a ghost atop Mount Silver, but he can be seen in the Alola region years on, side by side with his rival Blue at the Battle Tree. But no insight is provided there as to what he was doing on Mount Silver, nor is there any in Pokemon Masters, which is the only other game that prominently features Red. So to look into context clues as to what Red's doing there, we might have to look to some other canons. In the four-part story Pokemon Origins, which is probably my favorite of the Pokemon animated series, we follow the story of Red much as it was in the games. He takes on Team Rocket, gets his gym badges, and of course takes on the primary goal of the game to complete the Pokedex. He encounters the Pokemon Mewtwo in Cerulean Cave, the monstrous creation of Giovanni, and he learns all about it and traits about it from journals found in the Cinnabar Mansion. And at the end of the story, he realizes that there are more Pokemon out there than the 150 he encounters. There must be a 150. 51st Pokemon residing somewhere in the Pokemon world, and that Pokemon is Mew. We see it through the lab window at that time in Pallet Town. Pallet Town is a weirdly special place for Mew. In the Pokemon manga, which also features Red, Mew can be found in the forests around Pallet. In the animated series, when Ash returns from Alola, Mew once again can be found in Pallet Town. The location of the Cinnabar Mansion is just south of Pallet Town, of course. And while highly circumstantial, it's very possible that the events of the first Pokemon movie and the faraway island where Mew goes to take on Mewtwo is just off the shore south of Pallet Town. After all, Pallet Town is where Ash is holding up between getting all the gym badges and heading to the Pokemon League. And this connection to Pallet Town has actually come up in a theory before as to why Mew is in the possession of Professor Oak in Pokemon Masters. Pokemon Masters, for those of you who don't know, is a mobile game that really delves in deep to the lore of the Pokemon characters. I actually got to work on a few campaigns a couple of years ago about Pokemon Masters, and it was clear to me that the team had really done their research. There was very deep lore about Oak and Agatha and their relationship, as well as obscure characters like the Gen 2 female player character who only appears in Crystal, Chris, and how she's different from Lyra from Heart Gold, Soul Silver. There's really interesting stuff in there, and of all the things they decided to do, they paired up Oak with Mew. And it is interesting that Professor Oak, who created the digitized Pokedex, knew about Mewtwo. He had learnt about it from possibly his colleague, Professor Fuji. The name of this professor, by the way, matches the mountain which named Mount Silver, so that might become important in a moment. But 
Also, Oak numbered it as Pokemon number 150, meaning he must have known about the existence of Mew number 151, but not numbered the Pokemon to keep it secret and safe. So was it possible that Oak knew where Mew was and ultimately he directed Red to go to Mount Silver to seek out Mew to either complete his Pokedex or maybe to keep Mew hidden away from him? I think this is the case. However, the picture might become clearer if we zoom out and see what Mount Silver represents. It is at the center of a vast mountain range that covers the north side of the Kanto and Johto region, and there are a number of other points that are connected to this. Primarily, this mountain range connects round to Mount Moon and Cerulean Cave. Now, in a deeper Pokemon theory, I've done all about what Team Rocket was actually doing in Generation 1. I've already talked about this. Team Rocket were likely in Mount Moon looking for Pokemon fossils, not of Omanyte and Kabuto, which is what they found, but probably of Mew. It's possible that Cerulean Cave was Mew's original home, and that's why Mewtwo is drawn back there after its creation, after destroying the Pokemon Mansion. They were hunting the fossils around Mount Moon, and this is why you have Team Rocket Grunts stationed on the Nugget Bridge outside of Cerulean Cave, and of course, acquiring the TM for Dig from the people of Cerulean, because they were hoping to dig further into the cave from Mount Moon to acquire that Mew fossil. And it seems, of course, very likely that they were successful. This is where Mewtwo returns to at the end of the game, meaning Mewtwo was created, meaning that they must have found the Mew fossil. There must be traces of Mew all across this mountain range. And the part of this mountain range, the closest to Pallet Town, where the most Mew sightings across the Pokemon animated series has been? Well, that's Mount Silver. Now, as a little side note to all of this, in the original versions of Pokemon Red and Green, there's actually a team that belongs to Professor Oak. There was supposed to be a final boss there, much as Red is the final boss to Gold and Silver, and that was Oak and his team. But his team only ever consisted of five Pokemon. He had one of the starters, the remaining starter that you didn't choose, and uh, a couple of other very powerful Pokemon. But he was missing a Pokemon. There was an empty slot there, which for a final boss seems quite unusual. There's also the caveat that in order to get to the peak of Mount Silver, you also need Professor Oak's permission. You can't travel there without it. I believe that the Mount Silver mountain range, uh, leading all the way up and round to Mount Cerulean, is a special place where Mew roams. And this might have far-reaching implications into Pokemon lore, because the mountain range of Kanto and Johto, if you follow it northward, leads to the Spear Pillar and the Mount Cornet. So, the origin of the Pokemon world, and here we have the ancestor to all Pokemon in Mew. Additionally, I have to wonder about the inclusion of Espeon on Red's team. While the addition of an Eevee that evolves into Espeon likely is a reference to his manga counterpart, who has an Eevee that can evolve into all of the different evolutions until ultimately it settles on Espeon on Red's team, Espeon is in itself the Pokemon between Generations 1 and 2 that looks the most like Mew, and in fact shares a lot of traits. They are psychic cats with the same color scheme, and both have connections to unstable DNA that can turn into into many different things. It's a side point. And ultimately, of course, in Hot Gold and Soul Silver, it was later replaced with Lapras. I've also pondered the idea that perhaps Red on Mount Silver is, in fact, Mew. You ever wonder why Red can't talk? Okay, that is silly. But still, between Professor Oak's relationship to Mew and Pokemon Masters, the appearances of Mew all across Pallet Town and the Pallet Town area, the connection to Cerulean Cave, which is part of that same mountain range, and the fact that the very mountain, Mount Silver, is named after Fuji, the man who turned Mew's DNA into Mewtwo, suggests to me a connection. As symbolically, this makes sense as well, as Oak had already programmed in Mewtwo, and it was only after Red went up there and did in fact discover Mew that it was added to the Pokedex as number 151, the new species Pokemon. This Pokemon acts as the gateway, the door between the Kanto and Johto regions. And if nothing else, that is exactly what Mount Silver represents. I just want to say the absolute biggest thank you to today's sponsor, Discovery Travel, without whom I would not be able to visit Mount Fuji. I certainly wouldn't have been able to get out here. They helped hook us up with our JR passes. These are passes that allow us to travel around Japan. If traveling around Japan sounds complicated, that's actually what Discovery Travel are for. When you've imagined your dream trip out to Japan with friends, you've probably thought that you want to go to the Pokemon Centers, Pokemon Cafe, the Ghibli Museum, of course. 
but it can all be a little bit overwhelming. How do you book these things? Where do you start? And how do you go about traveling around Japan? Where should you stay for a hotel? Maybe you want to stay in the Pokemon Hotel. I don't blame you. This is where Discovery Travel comes in. They have a number of custom-made trips to Japan based on years of experience of sending people out, or they can make a custom trip tailored to you. Just send them an email to find out they're really lovely people. I said to them, I want to go on the perfect Pokemon fan trip to Japan, and they obliged, not just in helping us with sorting out things like the Pokemon centers and the Pokemon cafe, how our days should be structured, that kind of thing, but also telling us about the stuff that we didn't know about, like the 84 Hashi Cafe, a cafe run by an ex-Nintendo employee who actually was one of the coders for Red and Blue. His cafe is amazing, and it's a, a sort of well-kept secret in Japan. But if you're a Pokemon fan or a Nintendo fan in general, you would absolutely want to check it out and not want to miss it. So many cool collectibles in there. Discovery are going to help you create your perfect trip tailor-made for you and your friends, and can I recommend that you go in the spring? The summer was a little bit too hot for me, but the spring, I have heard, is absolutely beautiful. And the big thing they did for us is they helped us out by sorting out our JR passes. This is how you travel around Japan if you want to go and check out Kyoto, which, by the way, side note, you absolutely want to go and check out Kyoto. And if you want to get a jump start on the spring, there's no better time to start booking them right now. There is additionally some incredible deals going on on Discovery right now where they have up to $500, even $1,000 off some trips. Which is huge, so stop talking with your friends about how one day you'd love to go out to Japan and go discover Japan with Discovery Travel. So again, I just want to say the biggest thank you to Discovery Travel for sponsoring this video. Click that link at the top of the description. This is breathtaking, so I'm going to turn around before the clouds cover the rest of Mount Fuji. I don't want to miss this. Hello there, it's me, Professor Oak. This video is over, so please choose another one wisely and quickly. Bye bye. I owe the biggest debt of gratitude to those of you who've been supporting me over the years, including the big patrons of this month, New Orca, Michael Hornshoe, Lucas Gates, Jed Rubin, Charmander Ansible, and Anthony Lee. Thank you so much.